All right. The League of Revolutionaries joins other revolutionaries who challenge the ruling class on the immorality of his ruthless devastation of earth and life. We are a multiracial, a multiracial, multigenerational, and multigender working class organization dedicated to revolutionary education and struggle. We trace injustice to the capitalist system and seek to show how society's problems can be solved when it is reorganized along co cooperative lines. Society must be reorganized so that the abundance made possible by science and technology benefits all of us. A society that puts humanity and, and nature above profits. League events are safe spaces for inquiry and the exchange of information and ideas. We recognize that there are strong feelings on both sides of today's subject and request that everyone is respectful to our presenters and to one another. We have the pleasure to welcome to this conversation, Ms. Aya, who is a Palestinian activist based in the Midwest. She is a writer, poet, and member of the Healthcare, Cultural, and Education Worker Collective for Palestine and Professor Brahim Aoudi, I hope I pronounced that right, is Professor Emeritus of Ethnic Studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and the editor of Arab Studies Quarterly, an international journal about Arabs and their culture. His research and publications are in the areas of global geopolitics, the political economy of Hawaii, and politics of West Asia and North Africa. And then we also have Rabbi Brant Rosen, a native of Los Angeles. Rabbi Brant was ordained by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1992 and served congregations in Los Angeles and Denver before coming to the Chicago area in 1998 to serve as rabbi of the Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation. As a prominent Jewish presence in the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, he co-founded the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council and, you know, I, I'm doing the best, <laughs> Tanit the Deck, Jewish Fast for Gaza, and was a founder of the Sedek Chicago Congregation of which he became full-time rabbi in 2019. Um, he's also appeared in many journals and publications and look for his book, Wrestling in the Daylight, A Rabbi's Path to Palestinian Solidarity. All right, all right, everyone. So we're gonna start um, with Miss Aya. I'm going to read the first question and then also add whatever you, you know, would like to start with in your introduction to this. How is the attack of basic rights and denial of humanity in Palestine connected to the denial of basic needs in favor of war in the U.S.? What is the role of revolutionaries in this process? Thank you so much, Ms. Kimberly and everyone else in the league um, for inviting me to this conversation. I think it's a very important one. And I'm very grateful to be on this panel to speak with you all. In terms of the attack of basic rights, right, and the denial of humanity, to begin, I feel very speechless at the fact that not only Palestinians have been denied, been denied humanity, um, and this is a historic, you know, action from our oppressors. The reality is our struggles are connected, and that BIPOC folks, Indigenous folks, Black folks, uh, queer and working class people, migrants, and so on are 
humanity is constantly denied, right? And this unfortunately is what is used to exploit our labor and our um, existence, really. Um, when I was reflecting on this question, I was thinking of the words of Bassan Kenafani, who is a Palestinian revolutionary. And he says, the Palestinian cause is not a cause for Palestinians only, but a cause for every revolutionary, wherever he is, as a cause of the exploited and oppressed masses in our era, uh, our era right? So the reality is we are a part of these institutions we are a part of you know this society and the working class will continue in this capitalist society to exploit us therefore we are complicit and the right of every person is to do whatever is in their capacity right um i draw from inspiration of justice from my faith as a muslim and the reality is um the prophet muhammad peace be upon him says if you see injustice, if you can't change it, change it with your tongue. And if you can't change it with your tongue, change it with your hand. And if you can't change it with your hand, <laughs> change it with your heart, right? And that is the weakest of faith. That is the weakest form of justice. Um, that being said, I think some of us are tired, right? For many generations, we have continued to fight. The reality is it's the same struggle. It just looks different, but our oppressors are the same. They learn from each other. The blueprints passed on, you know, the technology is shared and sometimes we have to tap out. At the end of the day, we have to find what is going to get us to tap back in. I think it is human to take a break. It is human to rest. But what does it look like if you can't speak out, if you can't show up at a protest, if you can't do X, Y, Z actions, right? What are ways that we can bring people in? What does it look like to, for example, right? Instead of carrying shame and guilt that, you know, you wanna go to a community gathering but maybe you're gonna talk about things that are on your mind. Maybe you're gonna talk about things that are, um, you know, <laughs> with what's going on. I think that is impactful as well. I do think that there are ways to sustain and nourish ourselves through this continued struggle and there are different ways. And as someone who is a youth organizer, right? We, I have learned that we need to learn from the youth and also from our, our elders, right? Um, I draw a lot of inspiration and strength from my ancestors who were expelled and displaced in 48, right? The reason I exist is because I inherited a lot of, you know, their trauma and resistance, though. I've inherited a, little, a lot of their resistance. And though I no longer have any of my grandparents and they dream to return, right? within this generation, we will achieve liberation uh, for Palestine and all occupied folks. Um, and we will achieve our collective liberation of all oppressed people. So I just, I think it's important for us in whatever capacity we have to continue to show up. And sometimes that means resting because we're in this for the long haul. We're not in this for the short term. I think it's important for us to find ways to continue to do that without carrying shame and to just be honest um, and to learn from each other. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you, Aya. It's powerful. Um, Rabbi Rosen. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank thank you to the League. Thank you, Kimberly. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Aya, for those words. Um, I think, you know, I come from 
Jewish tradition, but so much of what I just said uh, speaks to from to my heart and mind and experience as a Jewish person. You know, I um, also feel a deep kinship to my own faith tradition and my own history and culture uh, as one of of resistance to oppression, uh, of one that lifts up the God of liberation, uh, and that draws strength from this history of struggle. Uh, and I see myself both as a human being, as a person of conscience, and also as a Jewish person, as someone who is is acting uh, in that tradition and receiving uh, those traditions from those who have come before me. Uh, I, I, I want to amplify and echo what I was saying about the importance of building solidarity um, by people who uh, are oppressed by these systems. I, I think ultimately our way through this is together. Uh, and, you know, the, the flip side of this is also true. Um, we need to understand that these, how interlocking these systems of oppression are. Uh, the, the capitalist system, uh, the war machine, uh, the systems of racism, uh, all of these things uh, are interlocked and intersect in really insidi in very, very insidious ways and have throughout history. Uh, but I draw strength from ultimately my own spiritual tradition that says that the God that we all share is a God that demands liberation and God that uh, stands with those who are oppressed and that no one one people are chosen. Um, if there are any people who are chosen, it is those who are oppressed. And um, ultimately, the work of all of us is to is to build relationship. I, I want to underline what I said too about the importance of uh, of finding ways to refill ourselves. Uh, you know, because the struggle is. I think this can't be can't be said enough. The struggle is terrifying, uh, the odds that we're facing together, uh, and it is also depleting. And we need to find ways to replenish ourselves. Uh, there's no shame in that. Um, in fact, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, this struggle for liberation is not going to work if we don't find ways to replenish wells that run dry. Um, and one very basic way we do that is through building relationships. For me, it it always goes back to that. Um, so finding avenues for celebrating together, uh, for expressing joy together, uh, to doing what we need to do together to find the, the strength to continue the struggle, because this is a long haul struggle and it didn't just start yesterday. Uh, and it's not going to end um, immediately tomorrow either. So building this movement is something that happens person by person, movement by movement, uh, and and building that kind of intersectional coalition that will stand down the systems of oppression, which are no less interlocked. Um, you know, the one thing I want to say, too, is that's key to all of this is education, both educating ourselves and educating the world at large about the ways these insidious systems actually work, uh, the way that uh, that the resources are used to in in ways that we either don't realize or just take for granted uh, to to oppress to oppress people. Um, most Americans likely don't know that uh, that the United States gives four billion dollars a year in military aid to the state of Israel. Uh, most Americans probably don't know that there's supplemental aid that's now being given uh, to Israel for its uh, its military onslaught, its genocidal onslaught on Gaza to the tune of $15 billion that's bypassing Congress. Most Americans don't know that this money uh, could be used to eradicate hunger. This money could be used to create jobs. This money could be used to uh, to improve the lives of all people, uh, include uh, most most uh, primarily working people who are uh, who are being oppressed every single day uh, in this country uh, and and around the world uh, because these capitalist dust systems are interlocked internationally. 
Uh, one thing that revolutionaries can do is in terms of education is learning about uh, resistance movements that are uh, that have long been underway. Uh, one very important one is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, uh, which directly targets uh, these sources of oppression. And I just on that note, I just want to note that, um, you know, for all of the vilification uh, uh, against BDS uh, or for those who criticize it for for not being effective, uh, we just learned we, we we're learning about victories happening all the time. Uh, and just most recently uh in in japan one of the largest corporations in japan has now divested from elbit systems which is one of the largest military and surveillance systems in israel uh switzerland uh is uh is ending its and uh, and spain are ending their arms sales to israel uh so shining a light on the 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 basic uh, financial sources of this oppression and taking a stand against and joining the international movement, which is a response to the Palestinian civil society call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, is one way that all of us can uh, participate uh, in the struggle. And I'll stop there. There's much more to say, but I'll stop there for now. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, professor Brahim. Yeah, call me Brahim. Forget about the professor. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, um, the world system is 5,000 years old, according to Andre Gunder Frank. Wallerstein calls it 1,500 years, and there have been other world systems before and after. Be that as it may, the fact of the matter is that the world is one and has been uh, intensified in terms of its unification through the global capitalist system. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, I'm Palestinian, uh, from a very young age, uh, I <clears throat> was against the state of Israel. That's what I called it before. Now I call it the Zionist entity. And, but I was, uh, for the United States, you know, I was like six, seven years old, you know, that's how politicized we have, we were Palestinians. <clears throat> anyway, later on, um, I figured out that <clears throat> it's um, um, the U.S. that's uh, <clears throat> the beast, according to <clears throat> Che Guevara. And therefore, now we are living in the heart of the beast. So it is uh, incumbent upon us to fight uh, the beast from the, um, from the inside. And um, the reason for this is because the world, you know, is um, a one whole unit uh, dominated by U.S. capitalism and its um, other... Uh, arms all over the world uh, through like NATO and the rest of it, you know, now you have AUKUS and FOCUS and MOCUS and Focus Focus, you know, whatever, you know, all these things that they come out with um, to try and maintain uh, U.S. domination around the world. I was uh, reading uh, Jake Sullivan's article in um, Foreign Affairs, I think it was October, September, October or something like that. And the guy, he has like weaved uh, all kinds of, uh, um, since we have a couple of people who are um, very religious, the rabbi and ayah, I don't know very religious, but religious. And they um, have like, um, uh, you know, created demons all over the world to try and oppress everyone. So when I look at uh, the global capitalist system, I figure out there are all kinds of oppressed peoples all around the world. And, um, and the fact that, in fact, they, uh, they uh, like rose up when they heard about the genocide in um, Palestine, Gaza in particular, but also <clears throat> a slower genocide happening on the West Bank which I call also East of Palestine, East Palestine. So rather than the West Bank, you know, but anyway. So um, that means that uh, beyond the question of humanity and what have you, 
um, there is a feeling that there is some big oppressor, you know, operating and uh, has all kinds of tentacles all over the world and is oppressing all the peoples uh, of the world. So uh, slowly, slowly, maybe it started the first like uh, uh, support for Gaza and against uh, U.S., uh, um, you know, um, war against uh, the Palestinians of Gaza, because I call it the U.S. war. Why? Because it's uh, U.S. planes, uh, armaments, ammunition, blah, 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 the rest of it. Uh, <clears throat> the Zionist entity is the executor of uh, that particular war. Um, and then NATO is there too, and uh, the rest of it. So um, combining, uh, you know, my um, um, life as a Palestinian, and uh, very quickly I became, uh, <clears throat> you know, a Marxist, and, you know, I'm a Marxist, and uh, revolutionary, I think, I hope I am a revolutionary. Um, and um, um, uh, relying on the uh, uh, Arab cultural tradition, uh, that created um, in me um, a voice and uh, a person who likes to act, who wants to act to help out um, in the liberation of humanity and to have a better system that really um, uh, helps, everyone, um, not like, you know, the, you're sitting down and the system comes to help you. The system doesn't do anything. People do the system, you know, make the system, right? So that kind of system requires revolutionaries to try and change the oppressive uh, global capitalist system. Um, <clears throat> there have been like all kinds of activities uh, regarding like uh, globalization um, to, um, <clears throat> to counter the globalization from above. So to call it like the globalization from below, which is a good uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> um, concept, globalization from below. But globalization from below without any organization, revolutionary organization is not gonna do anything except uh, you know making noise. Uh, and we know that in terms of the quote, um, quote Arab Spring, you know, people, millions, of Egyptians went to Tahrir Square and the rest of um, the uh, cities, uh, Egyptian cities. And well, what did we get out? Uh, what did we come up with at the end? We came up with another military regime pro US and not able to open the Rafah um, <clears throat> uh, uh, borders to send uh, trucks uh, of aid to, uh, to Gaza, the Palestinians in Gaza. So that's what we came up with without any organization leading and uh, you know educating, like the rabbi mentioned, education is very important. Educating them in all kinds of ways, including revolutionary education, so that the, um, uh, uh, the um, class that is now uh, being, uh, uh, is increasing in numbers, you know, this class of uh, dispossessed, um, that's the one that one has to rely on, whether it is in the, <clears throat> um, in the trade unions um, being threatened by becoming like unemployed or what have you, or wherever they might be on the street and what have you. Uh, these are the people who have nothing to lose, quote unquote, but their chains, you know. Uh, so uh, that um, kind of education and organization, organizing the people who are the most trodden upon by the capitalist system. And now in the United States, we have a fascist system. Um, what, uh, and the scientific um, uh, definition of fascism is the merger of the corporations and the state. And we've had that um, already. And um, it, um, uh, started probably uh, from like 2008 with the global uh, financial crisis. You know, we know that Eisenhower called, uh, talked about the uh, military industrial complex. So the corporations were there, but not in this way that they started coming with 
finance capital dominating since 2008, maybe a, before, a little bit before 1997. Some people say, be that as it may, the fact of the matter, we live in a fascist system. What we see now in terms of fascism in this country is that they, uh, the um, ruling class is trying to create um, you know, laws and a social movement that supports this fascist system. So that social movement would be fascist. So it's our, um, you know, it's, uh, it behooves us to fight this um, fascism and the fascist state. But to do so, we need to organize and organize in terms of um, looking at where, uh, what weakness do does the uh, ruling class in this country have, and we hit that point of weakness. And as uh, as we are educating um, the rev revolutionaries, there are revolutionaries all over, all, all over the place. They are um, they don't uh, perhaps understand everything as uh, some other people understand. So it is a question of um, teaching one another. Those revolutionaries can teach us a lot, and we can teach them. Um, you know, also a little bit, uh, at least. And in this way, uh, if we hit the blow at the weakest link in terms of the capitalist system and the ruling class, therefore we can win, you know, as Aya said, liberation, not for only Palestinians, but for everyone. And I stop here. All right. Very good, powerful. So again, this is a conversation. So we want to hear from our participants. You can put questions or comments in the chat. Many of you had started doing that already. Um, you can also use um, the, your electronic hand if you have a question um, for the presenters. So we have time for that now. If I don't see any, then we'll go to responses to the next question. But I know folks got some burning things to say. So I see a hand from Carrie. Go ahead, Carrie. You're on mute though. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, for Brahim, um, we are in Hawaii and we are Maui for Palestine and wondering how we can connect, if we can connect and how we would go about that, if that's uh, a possibility to um, connect us in a greater way. Aloha to you from uh, Haula. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha from Haiku. <laughs> Okay, good to, to know that. Um, in fact, um, we can connect. I can give you my um, oh, my email. It's uh, Aude, A-O-U-D-E-B for Brahim. Aude B at Gmail. So Wonderful. And we can connect from there. That's Thank you. Simple. Mahalo. Mahalo nui loa. <laughs> Mahalo nui loa and ahui ho. Ahui ho. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Making those connections. Miss um, Rosemary. I would certainly say with Hawaii, the question of the genocide of the indigenous Hawaiian people would be a way to connect because the whole issue needs to focus on genocide. And that's the battle we're having uh, with some of our unions in California. They're refusing to take that stance because they're so afraid of the Zionist minority within our union and we had a large labor for labor um for palestine la yesterday and a real push to get all our unions to take the positions that uaw have and even aft which is a very conservative union um american federation of teachers has taken a position on ceasefire so again it's a matter of education and that's what it always is. And the whole question of genocide is a link worldwide. And looking at the worldwide capitalist system, the canal they want to put through Gaza, the uh, 
oil and gas fields they found off the coast. This is a much bigger thing that that ties in with Ukraine as part of the whole fight around uh, petroleum, et cetera. So it's really transnational capitalism and fascism. Thank you. Could I say a, a bit in response to uh, Rosemary's point? Um, in terms of educating people about genocide and the genocide that's ongoing, I think there is um, resistance to using that word. I think it's really important to use that word uh, and not to use euphemisms uh, for many reasons, but uh, largely because that word has a very specific meaning in international law. Uh, and one way that we can educate people about that uh, South Africa's uh, uh, claim that they brought before the uh, ICJ, uh, the International Court of Justice, it's about an 85 page report uh, with almost 700 footnotes. And it is a very compelling document um, and can be used educationally to show people why this, why what is going on in Gaza, why, why what Israel is doing in Gaza amounts to genocide. Uh, and it's important also to let people know when people think of genocide, one of the reasons they they re are resistant to use that word is because they feel that somehow the Nazi genocide against the Jews in Europe during World War II uh, is the only kind of benchmark of what a genocide is. And in fact, a genocide, as I said, has a very, very specific meaning, legally speaking. Uh, there are many different ways that genocide is manifest. And so... In terms of the education, I think there are many, many documents, including there are Jewish and Israeli scholars of, of uh, historians and scholars of genocide who are saying um, that that this uh, clearly amounts to genocide. Uh, there's another article that was written in the um, magazine Jewish Currents by Roz Siegel, uh, which I also uh, often share with people. So I, I would just I would encourage people on this point um, not to shy away from that word because they somehow feel that uh, the genocide against Jews during World War II is somehow the only benchmark. Uh, um, and that it's, it's important not to use euphemisms. I'm saying that word out loud is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. And can I say something on that? Um, I wanted to first start um, my conversation with uh, the question that there is a uh, <clears throat> No question now that genocide is going on. And the reason that is the International Court of Justice, you know, agreed to accept, uh, you know, to uh, look into um, the um, uh, case, the South African case against uh, the Zionist entity in Palestine. Uh, so there's no question about that. And I agree with, um, with the rabbi about all of that. And it's important to keep using it. Uh, and, um, you know, um, what's his name? John Kirby, uh, who was an admiral um, before he retired, I guess. Uh, he was um, a spokesperson for the Pentagon and now for the uh, National Security Agency, NSA, from the White House, say, we have no proof uh, or any uh, kind of indication that Israel, he says, uh, has committed genocide, zero. And, uh, you know, one of the questions as he's talking, uh, a woman was walking by the street and she gets shot, you know, <laughs> zero genocide. And um, the spokesperson for uh, the United States uh, uh, State Department, at least in the region, uh, meaning like uh, West Asia, he was talking about, uh, you know, uh, it's only Hamas uh, using Palestinians as... Uh, <clears throat> as human shields, and that's why they're getting killed. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there are like uh, <clears throat> Congress people uh, who say that, uh, you know, uh, Madea Benjamin would uh, confront them in the hallways of uh, <clears throat> the Capitol and saying like, uh, uh, even uh, like babies, uh, you know, babies getting killed is okay because uh, they are Palestinians and they are uh, they are not fighting Hamas because he says, well, have the Palestinians get rid of Hamas and everything will be fine, you know. So even like Palestinian children under one year old getting killed, you know, anyway. So the question of genocide is is there. And uh, the U.S. is um, not only collaborating with it. That's why I mentioned the war is a U.S. war 
on Palestinians as it has been on indigenous peoples all over uh, the world. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Very powerful. So we did have another question um, that came in through chat. And it's an important question. Um, Brahim, you mentioned about striking at the weakest link. And any one of the presenters can respond to this. But the question is simply, what is the weakest link? Where is it? Um, you're on mute. Brahim, you're on mute. Mute, mute. <laughs> I thought I was open, you know, but anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, well, the, the weakest link is uh, where you have um, the um, uh, uh, people um, that are being fooled by the Democrats and the Republicans. To me, uh, Genocide Joe is a fascist, you know, so we cannot rely on Genocide Joe to fight Trump. Uh, as a matter of like getting rid of fascism or whatever, you know, because it's a fascist state, you know, and both um, these, uh, uh, you know, political parties are, you know, to be, uh, they are uh, parties of the ruling class. And in fact, now they are, um, you know, uh, even like a lot of people in the Democratic Party, maybe some from the Republican as well, are uh, opposing even genocide Joe um, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the genocide that uh, they're perpetrating on the Palestinians. And, and uh, anyway, so that uh, th this, uh, uh, this question is that a lot of people like who are Democrats here in Hawaii, for instance, still look, uh, but I want to vote for Joe, genocide Joe. They don't say that, but I'm saying genocide Joe. Uh, because, you know, it is like Trump, rather than begin like to do something else, you know, uh, that's one thing. So <clears throat> the, uh, the the other thing is that um, um, now that they are uh, like, um, uh, you know, uh, weak even in their own pol political party, you know, so what you have to do is to revolutionaries look at what the capitalists are doing you know, in uh, both parties, and um, the uh, people who are like supporting them from like the trade unions and whatever, because the trade or sub trade unions are supporting the Republicans, and uh, they're supporting um, you know the Democrats. So if we look at uh, and the and the unions and the workers themselves are being threatened, and uh, the um, the 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 uh, People like, you know, who are homeless, who are, uh, you know, under a particular uh, income level and so forth, uh, they, uh, you know, are being fooled by uh, the Democrats, at least the Democrats, you know. And so um, if we would begin to educate those people who are being threatened, even if they are working, because now they are working for like, uh, let's say, 30 bucks an hour, but before they were making like 70 bucks an hour or something, I'm just making up these numbers. So there is an area that is uh, very soft, you know, therefore this is the weak area. We have to, um, you know, uh, direct our propaganda on those people who are already out of the system, so to speak, and who are already being threatened to get, uh, you know, to start going like homeless or houseless or what have you. So that's, to me, the weakest link is right there. And so you got to hit on that. And if you hit on that, you also educate that the Democrats and the Republicans are two sides of the same coin because they are um, the, uh, whether it's Trump or genocide Joe, he would be, the president of the fascist state, which is oppressing not only the American, um, uh, you know, uh, new class that's coming out because of you know unemployment and or uh, <clears throat> or uh, what you call <clears throat> uh, uh, you know um, uh, 
part-time work and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we would um, focus on those groups of peoples who are dispossessed and all of that to uh, try and revolutionize them. And a lot of them have ideas, revolutionary ideas, but not uh, very well coalesced. So we can do that, you know. So um, uh, here is also, um, she didn't introduce herself, <laughs> Liana. Um, yeah, Liana here, she has something to say on that if uh, she may or I may uh, refer to her. Yeah, I just wanted to say that capitalism is based on the reproduction of surplus value. And in order to get surplus value, the capitalist system produces products that people buy and then they can have surplus value to expand and maintain capitalism. So we have to hit capitalism at the weakest link, which is in the economy, because if they are unable to sell their products, you destabilize the capitalist system. And then they cannot address this situation. So more people can target capitalism because of their inability to care for and and to take care of their populations. So this is one way to get to the weakest link by boycotting and refusing to buy products produced by capitalism. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, Ms. Aya, can you tell us uh, what you're seeing you know, among the youth and their level of consciousness around, you know, this issue. You know, there's a lot of movement and people are really activated, you know, by what's happening. Absolutely. Um, something that I have been sharing in conversation is that really the conversations and just the movement that is happening is riding on the coattails of other movements, right? So going back to 2020, 20 and the Black Lives Matter movement and the uprisings that did pave a lot of way when it came to the conversations around the Great Return March, right? And folks were like, yo, we can't act ignorant. We have to actually do the work. So I owe that to the Black struggle. Um, I also owe the connections and the increased conversation to drawing the links when it comes to indigenous struggles, right? Here on Turtle Island and also in the Kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and if I can begin to also talk about what the reality is on the ground in Palestine and threading it into the, you know, the next conversation, the reality is it's a land grab and it is exploitation of the land. And in the same ways that Manifest Destiny came about, now it's then making the desert bloom, right? In this land grab of 75 years, and even prior to that being colonized by the British, and even prior to that by the Ottoman Empire, right? When we view the land as something separate from us and not something that's a part of us, that is when we can exploit land. That is when we can exploit people. We can enslave people and things like that. Um, so it is the separation of humanity from people. And when it comes to building movement through students, when elementary students are pulled in to this conversation transnationally, uh, I do a lot of transnational organizing as well. And in Toronto, when middle schoolers were told they can't wear kafiyas, they organized a national kafiya day in which the rest of the city and people drew inspiration from. Here in Chicago, students in public schools, not only in the city, but also in the suburbs, did their own demonstrations, did walk in, like they walked out. And Another thing that we've been told, especially in the, the struggle for Palestine and our liberation, um, is that the, the old will die and the youth will forget, the young will forget. But we continue generation after generation to educate our youth. Um, and 
as someone who is an educator working with youth, who has worked with um, specifically student organizers in university settings and college settings and the censorship, right? It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we will always win. We will win. And we have to maintain that hope. Um, and initially I brought up the land grab conversation because It's tied to so many indigenous struggles. And we will continue to fight until we are all liberated. The struggle currently in Palestine, yes, it's an apartheid, right? And yes, it's a current genocide. There are forced evictions. They are kidnapping people. They are abducting folks. It's it's beyond what we can fathom as human beings. And I'm not the type of person, like I'm not good with numbers. <laughs> and I know as a person who's not good with numbers, me thinking about 30,000 who have been murdered in this genocide in Gaza, what does it mean to conceptualize the villages? What does it mean to conceptualize that? The reality is people, yes, as workers in a broad, definition is important and also as people in a part of society we're friends and families and neighbors and when these people unfortunately our oppressors are wiping out bloodlines and they are wiping out history and culture and all of that the unfortunate is reality is we can't even fathom what we've lost. Mm -hmm. And as youth in diaspora, there is immense grief. While also recognizing we have immense privilege that our grandparents, our parents survived. And we owe it to the people in Gaza and in Palestine, all of our occupied land, to continue the struggle and that is a way that we fuel ourselves. And relating it to my first response though, is we are people. And how can we deny ourselves the same humanity that we are denied by our, oppress our oppressors? We can't do that. We have to make sure we are fed. We have to make sure we're taking care of people. Labor and work is exhausting. And in a capitalist society where we have to sell our labor and our labor is exploited, we have to find ways, and as someone who is a cultural worker, to find nourishment, right? And bringing in education to educate and connect, to share wealth of knowledge, to enlighten people, to thread, thread also Ibrahim's conversations. Um, and I think that's the only way to maintain this movement is yes, we are workers and we are also people who have created these elements that bring beauty to life. And I think that's done through social, cultural phenomena. <laughs> um, and we also need to allow ourselves to be human with the reality of what is happening and what has happened to all of our peoples. So I'll pause there. Thank you, thank you. Um, that's a good segue. I have one last question for this section. Um, there was a question in the chat that asked um, about the complexity of many unions and the Imperial core with Democrats. What work can rank and file workers do to push back against their union's collaboration with Democrats? I know we got some labor people on here too. Anyone wanna answer that question? 
Why, uh, as you mentioned, like labor people uh, talk about it. Yeah, I was in the union too, but uh, that's another one. <laughs> but uh, maybe other people can. I, and then I might jump in later on. You know. Hey, sister, could you please repeat that question one more time? I'm, I'm kind of out of it today. Thank you so much. Okay, let me pull it back up. I'll copy it in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. So this is um, what rank, what work can rank and file workers do to push back against their union's collaboration with the Democrats? All right, hey Sue. Sorry, Carla, it's just been one of those weeks. Speaking of not taking self care, so we're we're in in a huge, massive front of struggle in Chicago. But I'm also uh, an executive board member in my union. It's not a very large union. It's about five thousand members, including a large retiree chapter. And one of the things we've been doing besides pushing Brandon Johnson to promote a ceasefire, which was a huge freaking victory in Chicago, took a lot of struggle, a lot of city hall uh, attendees. But um, we're doing educational efforts amongst our rank and file members because they're confused, because they're listening to the lies, because we have very dangerous Zionists that are even preventing our local from pushing a very simple ceasefire statement. So that that's one thing. I think education is key. And so I've been very strategic about who to invite, speaking of which, I'm still looking for some good speakers if anybody wants to uh, come up, especially the youth. But that, that's been vital and important. Um, and, and to have the tough conversations, because our local has been one of sheeple for a long time following a stupid, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop talking shit about our former president. And so now we're at this juncture where we're trying to fight for political power to meet basic needs, not just in terms of our stances with other workers, but on, on resolutions like bring Chicago home you know, and things like that. So it's important that we start to fight. Um, and at the same time, be critical of Biden. We have a lot of members that are very upset and don't want to vote. And I get it. But at the same time, we know what the dangers of having Trump as president again. Um, I, I organize the youth at my school also in this position and just trying to urge you to vote who could be a huge voting block, huge. You know, it's important to galvanize and, and really listen to their hurts and their concerns without invalidating their position but also the real dangers of having this piece of shit be present again, you know? Um, and so hopefully that helps a little bit. It's not the perfect model. We're still struggling. We're still growing, but it's definitely important that we continue this trend um, in all unions. Right. And yeah, I see that the AFL CIO, come on now, they did something. They took a stance. I almost fell out of my damn chair when I saw that, but that's big. That's huge. You know, and the United workers, um, the auto workers have a lot to do with that. They took a very principled stance early on, and we and a lot of teachers led the way. A lot of American Federation of Teachers, uh, sisters and brothers, and non-binary friends and others. So, you know, people think these statements don't matter, but they do matter. They do. I think they do make a difference, and they educate people. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we tend to always be in a position to vote for harm reduction not for who's really going to be making um, a change. Um, Steve T. Uh, yeah, the in regarding the unions, the struggle today is going to be producing new forms, of, you know, new uh, organizations. It's the thing Rosemary mentioned yesterday, uh, rally. Um, it was Labor for the number four, Palestine. You could look it up. There's a bunch of folks in the unions trying to fight that their leadership move rapidly towards ceasefire positions. But while we're trying to participate in these new things, we can't forget the established political processes that so many workers and others participate in. So I thought it was instructive, I put in the chat a while back, that in Michigan, some Arab American groups were calling on people in the Democratic Party that rather than sitting out the primaries vote no commitment don't do not vote for anyone it becomes almost like a plebiscite about the policies of the administration and it's much better than just sitting out because you get people get in the habit of sitting out political processes it's harder than go sit in when there's something a candidate or an issue that you need to to struggle around we want to fight in all the arenas that are important these new emerging things but also where masses of our class brothers and sisters are already going to be. And it doesn't mean supporting the Democrats to be there not saying, I'm not going to vote for this guy in the primary. Thank you. Um, one more hand, and then we're going to go to question two. 
Um, I see Mr. Mark L. I thank you. Um, I just want to push back a little bit on what I heard about Trump because we have been bludgeoned by this for years now to deaf ears. The Democrats have completely shut down the primary process to shove Biden at us without any regard. And for myself, and I know many others, genocide is a red line. There is no going back. You can't threaten us with Trump by saying he's going to do what Biden's doing right now. Biden is dead for so many of us. And they're going to keep pushing Trump, but the Democrats still have a card they can play if they have the, the spine to do it. And they can demand a floor fight at the convention because a one-person primary is not a primary. And Biden has already shown that he does not even have the capacity to hold office. His mental uh, uh, dementia is going way overboard. We see this in the press also. And what's happening is the plan, the plan that I see, is that they're just praying that Biden gets over that line, just squeaks in so that he can die in office and they can pass it to Kamala and then it's going to be the same thing election after election and they're going to shovel you know strategically from my point of view if it comes down to having to dupe this out in a civil war at home and not wanting this but if that's what it's going to be it's better to get over in four years and then have a clean slate in four years in 2028. But Democrats still have an option they can play if they really want to defeat Trump. And that's to have a floor fight at the convention. And that's what we should be fighting for, to replace Biden on the ticket so we have an option for, for defeating Trump. That people can actually get behind and have someone that has the guts to actually change the course that we're on. And that is what we should be pushing. And no matter where they gaslight us, we have to fight back with the truth. Excuse me, I get emotional about all this. I'll pass. I shouldn't even be speaking today, but thank you for Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a lot. It's And it's a lot of emotion on both sides. We want to be cognizant, though, that, you know, we and we spoke to it, that education is key. We also want to be careful of how we digest and where we get our news, right? Because there's concerted effort to control the narrative. And we need to, you know, educate others and educate ourselves about really what's going on and to, to get a counter narrative out there, you know, so people can question and inquire. Okay, we're going to go to our next question. And uh, ex excuse me. Um, may may I say something? I didn't. I physically raised my hand. I didn't put my hand up. Otherwise, um, who's speaking? Um, this is Deborah Hines speaking. Okay, go ahead. Uh, is my level of audio comfortable here? Yeah. Am I being heard? Okay, okay. Hear you. Uh, I I I simply have to. Say something, um, Kimberly, when you said our consumption of the news, that that is critical, you know, because I'm not seeing this firsthand. I'm seeing this through the media, this war in Gaza. I'm uh, watching Al Jazeera. I'd be interested uh, how many other people here watch Al Jazeera. The idea that the word genocide, that, that um, the world can't, can't claim that word. I, I don't know if this isn't genocide. I, I don't know what is. I tune into Al Jazeera with the question, what's the what's today's atrocity that I'm going to see? Um, it, so the use of words is, is so critical. Uh, I read the New York Times and over the years I've I've watched the New York Times choice of words. Uh, in describing this conflict between Hamas and Israel. And it, it's so blatant. Um, the uh, otherwise um, uh, 
not cherished, but respected New York Times is afraid to call the shot, a shot a shot, you know, that. But um, I just want, I'm going to look at my notes here real quick. Um, oh, um, Aya, you said uh, sometimes you have to tap out. And uh, I, I had to tap out and take a break from uh, Al Jazeera's coverage. It was, how many times can I see fathers digging in rubble with their hands for their children and their wives? Anyway, um, I, I just uh, I thank you for this opportunity for me to speak my emotions because that's what I'm doing here. And I, I really do appreciate it. And I'm honored to be here in this group today. Yes, well, thanks for joining. And again, this this conversation, the purpose of it is, you know, to not only speak on, you know, kind of what our shared knowledge, but to learn something, right? And, you know, there's understanding to be had on each side of the issue and collectively, right? Okay. Um, okay, so I see a couple of hands, but we're going to go to the next question. Just hold, hold that thought until we get to the next section for comments. So, um, the next question is, what is the reality on the ground in Palestine? Why should workers in the U.S. care? And how do we build a movement among workers around the world? Okay, so I'm going to direct that question first to Ms. Aya, if you'd like to start. Yes, I'll share just a little more. Um, I feel like I addressed most of the question um, when I spoke just a few minutes ago. Um, but as I was saying, and to summarize, at this point, it is clearly a land grab and we cannot fathom what has been lost in terms of culture, community, obviously the loss of life. Um, and the reality is that the focus right now and the attention is on Gaza and also throughout the rest of what, you know, we call 48, the rest of the occupied land of Palestinians, there is also um, ongoing forced evictions, right? When we talk about the movement in uh, Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah and those conversations, those, um, those movements have been ongoing. Um, there is absolute censorship People are terrified. We know that, um, you know, in Nablus, Khan Yunus, Janine, there are um, attacks on people besides the abductions, besides the kidnapping, besides the imprisonment. How many political prisoners um, have been put in uh, prisons? Um, and it's, it's horrific. It's terrible, um, to say the least. Uh, but this is just a small picture um, of what is going on, um, right? And as I was saying, when people, when the people who keep our movements going, the cultural workers, the activists, the student organizers, the academics, the writers, the journalists, the healthcare workers, these folks who engage with people and they're taken out of our society, they think that they will continue to like break down Palestinian society. But the reality is in the words of Mohammed al-Kurd, we are stubborn people. We are very resilient people and we will continue to fight and we will continue to struggle and resist. Um, and, and our struggles are connected. Uh, so we will continue to do that, but I will pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, Rabbi Rosen. Yeah, I just want to, um, again, um, underline and amplify what I just said, that what we see going on on the ground right now can't be separated from a larger context, which is, which is a Nakba, which is a, uh, 
an ethnic cleansing and dispossession of Palestinians that's been going on for 75 plus years. And this is just in many ways the the logical end game uh, of, of Zionism itself. Uh, and it's important to keep that in mind that Zionism is a settler colonial ideology and movement that is focused on creating a majority Jewish state in historic Palestine. It's an ethno nation. It's an ethno state. And so when you define a nation in those terms, uh, you are dependent on maintaining a demographic majority of one group of people in the land. And when you are dependent on that, that means people who are not part of that group are a problem. They're an obstacle to, to your realizing your national goals. And that has been the problem from the very, very beginning, that Zionism is a racist ideology and movement. Um, and now we're seeing it in um, in, in the most brutal terms. Um, so if we're going to talk about what's, what's going on on the ground, I think many people here probably know that um, uh, the, Israel, the Israeli military has been systematically uh, uh, destroying the Gaza Strip, which was filled with 2.2 million people. Uh, they have been systematically forcing them, uh, dispossessing them from their homes, destroying their homes so they have no homes to return to, which is what happened in the Nakba in 1948, um, forcing them uh, further and further south, uh, and then promising, quote unquote, safe passage, but then bombing the places, the roads and the destinations uh, that were supposedly supposed to be safe passage. And now we are seeing over a million people uh, at the southernmost tip uh, of the Gaza Strip in Rafa. Uh, and now is the Israeli military coming from you know, orders from the prime minister to uh, to evacuate from there. But there is absolutely nowhere left to run to. Um, uh, you know, there we are seeing a, a genocide unfolding in, in real time, in real time. Um, and uh, that is the reality on the ground. And that is what we have to shout from the rooftops, you know, that this is going on, on, uh, on the world's watch. It is being enabled by the United States government. It's not only simply being allowed by the U S government, it is being enabled. Uh, these weapons that are being used are paid for by U S tax dollars. Uh, Biden, can end this today with one phone call, uh, you know, but instead we've just seen a series of uh, either platitudes or mild wrist slaps. I think the latest comment from the White House was, um, we don't think, uh, you know, we, we Israel needs to to guarantee safe passage or some, some such meaningless comment like that. Um, so that is, you know, that is the reality. And, you know, I, you know, I have many Palestinian friends who are, um, if I could just address the the issue of of Biden for a moment, um, you know, who, who are saying, quite frankly, you know, we we campaigned for this man in the last election, uh, and the sense of betrayal is very very deep. Uh, these are people who, uh, you know, many of my friends who are saying, I am so deeply grieved because I am paying for my family to be murdered. It is my money that is being used. And I absolutely do not begrudge for a second anybody in the Palestinian American or Muslim community or the Arab American community to uh, to refuse to to vote for uh, um, this, this person. Um, I completely understand it. Um, and I... I understand the the difficulty of this debate. I appreciate some of the arguments that were brought forward, like bringing something to convention. But beyond the the, the issues of specific strategy about what to do in this moment, um, I think we need to to lift up that what we are facing right now is an intolerable intolerable situation in terms of hum of of the basic humanity. Um, it is a moral question. It is a a moral reckoning that I think for most of us we're never going to see the likes of this in our lifetime it's a it is a which side are you on moment and um in terms of what we do going forward we need to stress that do you, are you going to be on the right side of history or not um one final thing i'll say um we were talking about different strategies as far as what is the weakest spot and i don't know i i'm i'm not an expert i i don't think in those kinds of kind of singular terms about identifying one 
you know, paramount weak spot. I think um, in movements, we have a toolkit and we have many different tools we can use and many intervention points that I think we need to identify and to, and to mobilize for. So, um, but one, um, you know, and I know there are many people who are not, um, and probably many people here, who are not naturally people who engage in electoral and political advocacy. Um, but I do think electoral organizing and, and political organizing is one of those tools. And I just wanted to lift up that uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib uh, has introduced uh, a bill that we should all know about in, in Congress. It's called the Stop Politicians Profiteering, Profiteering from War Act. Um, and it's uh, a bill that is designed to prohibit members of Congress, their spouses, and their dependent children on having any financial interests in any company <laughs> that does business with the Department of Defense and banning them from trading defense stocks. Uh, and if you go to, uh, and Cori Bush is a co-sponsor of this bill. If you go to Congress uh, person Tlaib's uh, website, you can find out more information about that. But I think this is an example of, you know, the inside game, um, someone who is uh, is working very, very hard uh, inside the halls of power under incredible, incredible stress and pressure to uh, identify a weak spot. Um, and that's something that's worthy of our attention and our support as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so, Brahim, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> Um, like uh, uh, complementing what has been said by Aya and the a rabbi, <clears throat> which I completely agree with. Um, I'm just going to say like what um, Zionist Hasbara propaganda has been. Like it's a fight against Hamas. <laughs> you know? So it has nothing to do with the Palestinians. But they let the whole world know that it is about Hamas, that is a terrorist organization, blah, 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 all that Hasbara propaganda. Uh, the fact of the matter, it is a war against the Palestinian people. And now uh, people around the world know this. It's not only Hamas. And Hamas, anyway, is part of the Palestinian um, people. And it came out uh, from the first intifada, um, I see Alan had put something about the first intifada and how he uh, was covering it as a correspondent or a newspaper person, uh, which is uh, uh, which was good. Uh, you know, Alan, uh, I like uh, what uh, how he thinks uh, anyway because uh, we've been friends for a while, for a long while actually. Anyway, uh, so the thing is that. Um, uh, Hamas is part of the Palestinian people, came out of the first intifada, you know. And in fact, it's interesting to know that uh, Hamas, uh, the uh, Zionist entity, helped create Hamas, you know. Um, why? Because it was like a religious uh, kind of uh, organization from the Muslim brothers. And what they wanted to do is uh, create, make the Palestinian uh, struggle something Muslim versus uh, Jewish. And therefore, if uh, Al-Fatih organization was, uh, you know, most of them Muslim, but they were Christians in it, etc. But um, if it is secular, they don't want the thing to be secular, Palestinian against like Zionists. They wanted to make it like, because they believe in the Jewish state, they want to make it like, okay, you know, we are fighting with the Muslims. Anyway, they created Hamas, thinking that Hamas... <clears throat> would um, you know um, um, you know um, convert the or uh, move the Palestinian struggle all the way from being like uh, for liberation of Palestine to something about Muslims and all that kind of stuff you know but Hamas uh, disappointed them all and the proof of that is October 7th and uh, it is uh, you know there are like, two fighting organizations in Gaza that are secular, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and other secular groups also fighting, along with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, etc. So it's a question of liberation of Palestinian lands, you know, and the lifting of the siege and um, trying to 
get uh, the prisoners uh, <clears throat> who I call hostages out of um, uh, the Israeli uh, or Zionist prisons. Uh, before October 7th, there were about five to 6,000 uh, prisoners or hostages because they pick him up from the street any, any which way, you know, it doesn't matter if he or she did anything or not, if they didn't shoot them, you know, on the spot. Anyway, uh, but since October 7th, there's another about five, 6,000 more. So you have like 11 to 12,000, you know, hostages <laughs> in, uh, in Zionist prisons right now. So that is a reality. So part of um, the October 7th movement uh, is to free all those hostages. Mm -hmm. And I insist on calling them hostages. Um, so that is um, uh, something that is happening there. So the other thing is that <clears throat> uh, Zionist Hasbara and the American capitalist Hasbara with them talk about, well, um, uh, it was an unprovoked uh, attack by Hamas, and they sent thousands of people to attack uh, people who were like celebrating and dancing and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, the question of um, 40 babies, they beheaded 40 babies and, uh, you know, raped women and all that. Then even like, uh, what's his name? Genocide Joe was uh, talking about 40 babies being beheaded. And then later on said, oh, we have no proof of that, etc." Even I think the New York Times or Washington Post or another took away that kind of story from their um, archives or something because it was BS, basic. You know, anyway, um, so it didn't start on October 7th. Why, when it did it start, it started with the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948, very well documented by Israeli historians, including Elan Pape in his book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. And, um, you know, other, um, other historians, uh, Benny Morris, um, also he did that. Uh, uh, but um, the difference between Elan Pape, and this is parenthetically, between Elan Pape and Benny Morris, Benny Morris says, but well, we could have done even more than that. You know, he wanted to have more uh, ethnic cleansing at the time. So it started from there. It started from all the people that have been killed from 1948 and even before fighting against the British, etc., and against the Balfour Declaration in 1917, November 2nd, and the rest of it. So that's when uh, it started. So um, the, uh, you know, Edward Said talks about beginnings. You know, one of the thing about beginnings is that you cannot just like pick and choose any place to begin from. You know, you got to pick and choose where it started, really. It started in um, even, I would say, before um, the Balfour Declaration it's, uh, of 1917, it started with the Sykes-Picot Agreement of uh, 1916. That's when it started all, and all the kinds of uh, situation that happened with the Palestinians. And um, we have lost over a million people over this, uh, uh, over this uh, <clears throat> struggle for over 100 years. From 1988, you know, the first Intifada, 87, like December 8, 1987. So let's say from 1988 till 2022, 150,000 Palestinians dead and wounded, mostly dead, not wounded, you know, happened. And that, what did we get out of this? The Oslo Agreement, which, um, you know, um, uh, this Oslo Agreement lost most of Palestine and the uh, east of Palestine, called quote unquote, the West Bank. Okay, now you have leopard spots, and only like you know about eight nine percent of the twenty two percent of Palestine, which was Gaza and the and the um, east of Palestine, the West Bank, um, is left. You know, the rest of it is um, you know settlements, uh, which I call colonies. I don't call settlements Israeli uh, Zionist colonies. Um, and then they are taking more in Sheikh Jarrah and all of those kind of stuff. I have talked about this, you know, so that's when it started. It didn't start on October 7th. So in our kind of education, etc., we should all talk about these kinds of things 
and not about October 7 and uh, and human shields that Hamas is using babies as human shields and all of that. Uh, now, um, it's very impressive that the rest of the world, uh, you know, is no longer buying all of this, especially after the International Court of Justice, but but also well before, like the um, <clears throat> the demonstrations happened in, in London and other UK cities, the demonstrations that happened in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., New York, and other U.S. cities, etc., speak to the fact that the people ain't buying any of this any longer, you know. So, uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, in terms of the uh, Palestinian narrative, the Palestinian narrative has won all over the world, maybe not in every place, uh, not, well, almost all over the world, not in every place, but uh, like in the United States, I would say, uh, we have made a huge dents in the Zionist propaganda and in the capitalist propaganda against the Palestinians, etc. Uh, someone mentioned about, uh, which is true, about why do we want uh, the Palestinians out of uh, Gaza? Well, it's, um, <clears throat> and this is the, um, you know, the importance of the global situation uh, and how uh, October 7th, West Asia in particular, uh, in um, general, and the Palestinian October 7th in particular, and even before October 7th, the Palestinian, the Palestinian struggle for liberation is at the center of what's happening not only in the regions of uh, West Asia and North Africa, but it's around the world. And the proof of this is the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, aircraft carrier, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Eisenhower and uh, General For uh, uh, Gerald Ford. They yeah. came to uh, <clears throat> they Brian, came to the stop Mediterranean. right here because we, we got several on stack and we got some good questions. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> one last uh, point. Uh, in so and so far as what uh, can we do to have a uh, to create like a revolutionary, um. Uh, situation around the world, organizations, etc. Well, we shall begin with here, and how we begin with here, um, you know, hit at the weakest link, and we know what the weakest uh, link now, the ones that who have been dispossessed and have hardly anything to lose but their chains. That's where the weakest link is in. Organize, uh, grow the organization, <clears throat> and then connect with other revolutionary organizations around the world. That's how we do it. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Can you. I say something? Thing? Okay, hold on just a second. I'll, I got so, you. I'll, Let me. I'll, 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 Monica, you're breaking up a lot again. Chat it out. Yeah, put it in chat, Yolanda, and then we'll get, we'll, we'll see it and get to it. There's one uh, question in chat that I it's important. This is coming from Salvador. Um, and this is directed to, to Rabbi Rosen. He asks, can you speak to the opposition <clears throat> of what Netanyahu is doing within Palestine? And he mentions that a friend who is a professor locally who is Jewish was from Iraq and moved to Israel. He served in the military and was treated as a second second class because he was not a European Jew. Yes, I mean this is part of the history that we've been talking about. Um, you know, I as far as education, by the way, um, on on this particular issue, there's a wonderful book by uh, an Israeli historian who actually was originally uh, born in Iraq, uh, Avi Schleim, and. Uh, is one of the historians, Brahim was referring to Israeli historians who uh, chronicled the Nakba. Uh, and his latest book is called Three Worlds, uh, where he talks about growing up in Baghdad and um, the uh, the birth of of the, the state of Israel and, uh, and the Zionist false flag uh, projects that they uh, that they instigated uh in inside uh iraq in order to get those uh jews who had lived there for centuries i mean it was a very very um venerable jewish community the baghdadi jewish community it goes it traces back to the babylonian exile 
um, to force them to to flee to Israel after after 1948, um, and talks about his treatment of his family. Um, he came from a fairly affluent uh, uh, merchant class family and uh, were overnight uh, treated as second class citizens and um, you know, uses his experience as a microcosm for the experience of Jews from uh, from Arab countries, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and others uh, who um, were brought to Israel through the the narrative of uh, uh, of fleeing for their lives, when in fact that these were these were Jewish communities that had very very deep roots in these country uh, in those countries. Uh, so that's that is something that's part of the history, uh, the colonial history uh, of of Israel. Israel was a European, uh, it was a European colonial state that literally transplanted uh, white European Jews to uh, to historic Palestine, um, and then brought in um, others uh, from from surrounding countries uh, because they needed, going back to what I was saying before, that demographic majority of Jews in the state. Um, that's I highly recommend Schleim's new book. It's called uh, Three Worlds. And that, just to add that to the list of the education that we've been talking about. Great. Okay. So I'm doing progressive stack first for those who haven't had the opportunity to speak or ask a question. Um, Mr. Darnell. Hello from Berlin. Uh, you know, I live in Berlin. I can't say that often enough. And there's a certain veil of history that hangs over me and all the inhabitants of Germany. In fact, the uh, the Nazi resurgence, the the many hundreds of thousands of the people who are demonstrating on the streets, is an indication of the situ situation of the of the situation presently facing people. Um, you know, I do a lot. Of, <clears throat> excuse me. I do a lot of, of thinking about political organizations who had discussions around the time of the Nazi takeover, but even before the, the elections. And uh, I'm surprised at, at some, of the, some of the things I hear in the comments that were made by, by people in this group. Um, certainly, um, it's, it's the same comments were made in, 30, uh, in 29, 28, 30, 31, 32, you know, and into the the election of um, Adolf Hitler. Actually, he wasn't elected. He was selected as a chancellor, you know. But this process, the 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 electoral pro, the electoral process was part of the deal. And I, I think it's time for people to look at the situation, look at what happened historically, uh, to to make an analysis. I wanted to, wanted to say something of make, making a comment about what something I, that Aya said, said. She talked about, you know, getting arrest. And for our adversary, we have to be we have to be relentless and tireless. That's a prerequisite to any victory. You know, we can't afford to get tired. You know, we don't, we don't, we, we don't have the respite, you know, and another thing I heard in my early political involvement was the statement that you shouldn't let events get ahead of you. Well, that's is exactly what has happened on so many fronts, whether you, whether you talk about the presidential election whether you talk about, talk about Biden, whether you talk about Trump, whatever, what have you, events have overtaken, overtaken some aspects of the struggle. And that's very unfortunate, you know? And we're operating not from a good tactical position, you know, given the fact that 
we somehow are still, st still struggling with the lessons of history. The fact that you have the German government concerned about a, a Nazi resurgence in Germany. You know, I'm 76 years old. You know, I've seen all of this. You know, I've, I've, I've seen the result of, of the Second World War. My uncles were, cousins were involved in, in it, in, in, involved in a uh, segregated army, all kind of shit, you know. And it's time to connect the dots. Please, you know, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know. It's, uh, uh, I don't know. Thank uh, you. What, 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 thank you, you know. I mean, what, what, what I want, what, you know, everybody knows what that damn the genocide is, mass murder. There's no debate about that. Let's don't make it a debate. You know, I mean, it's in the, in the eyes of the so-called masses. You know, because there's this line out there that people really don't understand what's happening. Yeah, they understand it. Black people understand it. You know, um, the indigenous in indigenous population in America, uh, the colonies understand it and because they would. And they that went is through the that. point of you know for us uniting around that. You know. Well, I, under so, I understand so that. But let I me understand. go. Let me go. I got a lot of hands. Let me go to the next speaker. Thank you, brother. Uh, Jerome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's a very critical conversation that we're having. And, and I think it's some really serious points that have been raised that we need to continue discussing. But I just wanted to raise two things uh, just to be precise and con concise, um, we have to remember that here in the United States, the two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, are servants of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. Elections have never determined whether or not we were going to make progress in our struggle. That struggle has always, that decision has always been made in the struggle in the streets and in the factories and in the schools around this country. You know, so let's not think that if we get rid of Joe Biden and another Democrat comes across the table, that electing that Democrat is going to stop the genocide in Palestine. You know, as a matter of fact, the second point I want to make is the genocide in Palestine is an ongoing affair. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you do just a limited amount of research, you know that the Palestinian people have been murdered day after day. They have they have been thrown out of their houses and their houses set on fire. You know, so that they couldn't come back to it. You know, this genocide didn't start on October 7th either. You, you know, and so we have to we have to really think on two levels. One, what can we do immediately to try to stop the genocide and call for a ceasefire? That is really critical. And you know, you can't blame anybody for blaming Joe Biden and the really? Democratic Party for that. But the second point is that we got to look at this from a class perspective. You know, neither Trump nor Biden is operating individually. They're operating in response to a section of the ruling class that is supporting them and making sure that they stay on a path. And if, if we can look at it from a class perspective, then we have to look at it from why is it that they want to build a canal someone saying something? No, go ahead. Uh, building a canal through the Gaza. You know, who would that benefit? I mean, there's some economic issues here that we're not talking about that have been mentioned, but we're not talking about them that plays into this whole question of why the Democratic Party is going to, in one way or another, support the occupy, occupation of Palestine and support the genocide in Palestine, whether they say it or not, and whatever they put forward. So the two points I'm trying to make is that we can't trust the Democrats. We never could. And if we're going to solve this problem, we have to think of it 
The one level, what can we do immediately? The second level is that our education has got to be focused at, we have got to get rid of capitalism, which is the fountainhead of all this genocide. And until we do that, we're going to be fighting one genocide after another, including one here at home. Pass. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Um, Lou and Diana. If you're talking, you're on mute. <laughs> Probably on mute. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I, first of all, I really thank the organizers of this event for the for the discussion, which has really been helpful. I really, um, really leaned into the last section that uh, Brahim was talking about historically and all of the comments that the main presenters, Aya and Brandt, have also uh, put forward. But I wanted to make a, a quick comment and ask a question. The comment is related to this question of what is the weak point? And it seems to me um, there's two ways of going at this. There's a singular point, and there are many. Uh, and the singular point that I want to highlight uh, is the, the, the fact that capitalism is unable anymore to provide for the people of this country or any country for that matter. And, and you see that in the, in the streets of Chicago with the people who are homeless. You see that with the immigrants and the asylum seekers who have crossed the border or die in the Rio Grande, but on the, on, uh, are bust to Chicago and dropped in the streets unceremoniously. You see that kind of thing. And of course, um, Jerome just mentioned the question of, of genocide in this country. You see that in the, the disinvestment and the destruction of the population of, especially the South and West side of Chicago, where uh, so much of, of the population, uh, something like 200,000 people or more in the last decade have left because it's, it's, it, it has been so bad. Now, if that's, that's not um, a, nobody's calling that a Nakba, but in a certain sense, that's what we're talking about. So my, my point is that there is a a common that's a commonality we have to understand and that it's also the weak point that they can't provide for the people then the people have to reconstruct society in their own interest i think that's the the weak point that is so important but in order to get there in one of the ways in order to get there is to recognize the genocide that's happening certainly in Palestine, and that is a, that's a moral, becomes a moral question. Uh, you can talk figures all you like. You can talk how many homeless people there are. You can talk about the 30,000 uh, immigrants who have come to Chicago in the last couple of years from Texas. You can talk about that if you want, but it's really, it's the people who are dying in the streets, whether they're in Palestine or on the streets of Chicago that get to the heart of the American people. And it's really crucial to reach uh, that moral high ground. The last thing I wanted to ask, though, because I think, uh, and this is something that Jerome brought up in his comments, that I'd like uh, the one of the speakers or all of the speakers to, to respond to. But I think, you know, Brahim with his uh, years of, of uh, historical understanding can certainly address this, is what is the, you know, Brahim mentioned a couple of revolutionary organizations in Palestine right now. What I'm wondering is what are the class forces? How would you, how would you describe the class forces uh, as they're operating within this revolutionary situation in, the, in Western Asia? That's a big question. That might take about five hours. <laughs> I think uh, we need uh, uh, another uh, get together a Zoom meeting on that. 
Uh, I didn't mention much about uh, Russia and China and all of that because uh, in uh, previous talks, we uh, I talked a lot about Russia and China and the global situation. That's why I didn't mention much of it, except to say that October 7th really uh, showed the centrality of the of West Asia and the Palestinian uh, situation in particular. And the proof was the Gerald Ford and the Eisenhower, etc., and trying to wipe out uh, Palestinians, uh, you know, ethnically cleansed or, uh, you know, genocide of Palestinians from Gaza is because of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the counter to it, which is, uh, you know, uh, the the route from uh, th through Saudi Arabia all the way to Haifa Airport, and then the Ben Gurion Canal through the Gaza. Uh, strip and all, and all of that. So that's the thing. Um, in terms of uh, what uh, Lou was talking about, the class uh, issue, well, uh, most Palestinians are, uh, are uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, they call middle class. I would call middle income, lower income. A lot, most of them are lower income. And if you talk about Gaza, uh, most of them are low income, very low income, very, very, very low income. So, I mean, in terms of the class composition, here it is. But uh, because it is uh, a war of liberation, you know, you have to, uh, like, uh, talk about it um, in terms of the national struggle. But the point is, who is going to lead the national struggle? Is it going to be the Palestinian bourgeoisie like Mahmoud Abbas and the... Uh, Palestinian Authority, these are collaborators with the Zionists. So um, these are out. I mean, hardly anybody talks, uh, deals with them now, except those people who are still getting salaries from them. And what I call the Dayton boys, the 60,000 Palestinian armed uh, police or whatever, doing the bidding of uh, the Zionist state and like pursuing and wiping out uh, Palestinian revolutionaries from 2006 till 2015, they wiped out a lot of Palestinian revolutionaries uh, for, um, uh, you know, in the service of uh, the Israelis from 2006 to 2015. Put a lot in jail, killed, beat up, the, you know, the rest of it, you know. Anyway, so I think uh, the uh, liberation struggle now is, um, is, uh, you know, led by. I have a quote. Yeah, by. Question, Brian. Yeah, by, the by the petty bourgeoisie. Were... And not the other guys, you know, not the uh, working class or whatever. I'm telling you this as it is. And, but anyway, this is a national liberation struggle. Hopefully, the left forces would uh, later on uh, become uh, more, uh, have more say in the situation, but uh, not yet. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we do have people on stack. We're going to be wrapping up very shortly because we're actually a little over time, but it's been a great conversation. Um, I see Pedro, and then um, we'll go to Irv, and then I see you, Rosemary, hey, Sue, and Steve T. Pedro. If you're talking, you're on mute. Um, still on mute, Pedro, if you're speaking. Okay, I can hear you now. On mute. Your computer might be on mute. How about that? Okay. I think you, there you are. Go yeah. ahead. All right. <clears throat> well, I basically wanted to underline, <clears throat> excuse me, that I told you, uh, underline that, you know, regarding the uh, one of the three questions that I, and, and you know, was asked at the beginning of the discussion, regarding the role that working class people can play in the context of this struggle. 
and just basically reminding myself that our role as revolutionaries is primarily in the forefront of propaganda war. This is a propaganda war. <clears throat> and on, on our end, the that's really the, the, the main terrain of struggle, propaganda contest that we have. Uh, Palestinian people have been uh, spilling their blood for almost a century in their fight against imperialism. And uh, <clears throat> so imperialism is one of the key words in our propaganda tool chest. And I don't hear it often enough Unfortunately, this is set in very general ways. But it, it, it seems to me critical that we underline, underline in, our, in our propaganda talking points the fact that we are citizens of the empire and that the US, US imperialism is really the, the protagonist on this side of the, uh, on the side of the struggle uh, of the oppressor side of the struggle. To the extent to which we are citizens of the empire, we are both complicit and also victims of that empire as well. And I believe that in, in, our, in our propaganda talking points and our propaganda work, we must place a lot of emphasis on that. I, I, I believe that discussions on uh, around the question of policy are often misleading if you ignore that. You ignore the fact that we are dealing with an empire that <clears throat> pretty much is relies in this stage of decline, as the US empire is in a stage of decline, is relying primarily on its military industrial complex and its financial structures in order to survive. And that translates in turning imperialism into a, a death machine, a, a machinery of murder, mm. of mer a, a merchants, merchants of, of death. Uh, and it, I believe it's, it's, a, it's, it's a point that must be, st must be uh, stressed in our, in, our, in our propaganda and link that to the fact that those, those very, those merchants of death are not just killing Palestinians, they're killing people everywhere where there is where, where, where a similar situation occurs, a situation where people are resisting colonialism and imperialism. Um, and that includes the United States. Um, within the United States, it's also a struggle against imperialism and to the extent to which we, we have to fight capitalism, uh, which is the, the main umbrella. Uh, of the system. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, okay. I can't speak anymore because I'm really very sick. But I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, brief questions. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, Irv. Irv, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Oh, how about that? Okay. okay. All right, good. Very, very uh, brief question. Uh, education has been brought up uh, a lot. Um, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is a, is a reality. It's, it's a violent hatred of a, of a group of people, but it's also been weaponized. The uh, Anti-Defamation League has admitted that uh, two-thirds of all of the instances and statements and so on that they label as anti-Semitic have especially been pro-Palestinian uh, uh, pro Gaza and, and pro peace. So, uh, uh, how do we approach that? We're way behind, I think, in, in the ability to uh, counter this type of propaganda. So, I asked the panel, how do we move forward on this? Okay. Thank you so much for your question. And I can speak to this because anti Semitism is real and it is vile, it is disgusting. Right. It has been weaponized. It continues to be weaponized. It is unfortunately in the ways um, it's violent. It's terrible. It's been used to, you know, commit genocides and or, you know, 
Um, I believe that in the same ways that we want to eradicate all isms and all of phobias, and it is through collective liberation and organizing, that is the approach. It is not censorship and, um, you know, conflating actual indigenous <laughs> ethnic cleansing that is happening in Palestine um, when it comes to criticism of a state and settler colonial project um, that is Zionism. It comes back to what does our collective liberation look like? And it does include eradication of anti-Semitism. And that needs to be the approach. It can't be weaponized in the ways that it has been now. Yeah, I'm in complete uh, agreement with Aya. Uh, we need to understand anti-Semitism as part of a larger uh, spectrum and system of, uh, of hatreds that have been systematically used against peoples. Um, and the answer as ever is solidarity, um, building a movement of solidarity that includes anti-Semitism uh, with all of the other forms of weaponized hatred, whether it's uh, any form of racism, uh, any form of uh, bigotry that is weaponized against a particular group of people, these are the people that need to stand together. And you know, the, the single an word answer to your question is solidarity not treating anti-Semitism as somehow unique or different um, and not uh, equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, but that's my brief answer to the question. Vito, and that's it from me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I see Rosemary and Steve T. Okay, I have four uh, quick points. Um, if we're putting together a resource site, please put alternative news sites. Uh, number two, of course, Palestine um, includes Bedouins and includes Christians. Churches have been bombed and uh, hit as well. And when we look at the United States, there's the role of the white supremacist evangelists who certainly don't represent um Christians in the United States, but they're playing a key role in the way they're manipulated by certain forces. Um, three, um, let's look at immigration because there's uh, thousands of immigrants that were brought into Palestine to work just as they were brought into this country. And that's, you know, where as Palestinians have been completely displaced, just like indigenous people uh, were within the United States. And looking at that huge mar so-called march of immigrants coming in uh, through Mexico, it really represents a mass movement, a class conscious mass movement of immigrants from all kinds of different countries. So that awareness is growing. Um, my last point is looking at the questions of a global police state and fascism as part of developing worldwide under transnational capitalism. I saw a meme that placed it very well. How many people watching these memes are not thinking about the possibility in their countries? What do you do with a so-called surplus population? That could be us. That could be so many countries where you have people being displaced by capitalist ventures, which are destroying the environment, uh, war, what's going on that's been going on historically in Central America. So this whole question of this change with the economy and huge numbers of people throughout the world that are being displaced and what will happen to them. So people might are beginning to connect the links. Yeah, that can happen to us too. And it's a worldwide system. Fascism isn't just arising here. We've seen it recently, even in the so-called wonderful countries like the Netherlands, the Philippines, Argentina, um, Spain, uh, Nicaragua, et, et cetera. <laughs> thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. So quick, two last quick comments. We're gonna be ending um, very shortly. Uh, Steve T and then Jesu. Uh, the panelists all talked about uh, the importance of um, 
information. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to see the screen. I'm trying to show um, the the web page for Rally, mm -hmm. the league's political publication. Some of the ideas you heard Brahim express right now uh, were utilized in the article along with other ideas of, of fighting folks. So I really urge you to look at this article. It's a top article on the website, Gaza War Machine Made in USA. You find it at rally-theleague.org. And it's a way to follow this up and maybe even contribute uh, your own thoughts in the future uh, as this fight goes on. Uh, rally wants to hear what other fighters are saying. Yes. Visit us on social media as well. You know, we are on uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, hey, Sue, go ahead with your last comment. And uh, then it's actually, it was a question and it's emerging because I, I also teach for a living at Harold Washington College. And a lot of my students are in various fronts of struggle by necessity. But then there are those that are completely losing hope. And I, I there were students who were vehement that peace was not possible in the Middle East. And my question to you is, is peace possible in the Middle East? And if so, how are we going to get there? I think this question of solidarity is key. Um, and that that's it. I know it's a big question, but I think it's an important one. I'll just say very quickly, um, you know, we need to define what peace is. Peace is a big, mushy, uh, you know, uh, ethereal concept, I think. We need to focus on equal rights. I think everybody who lives between the river and the sea need to be have equal rights, equal citizenship, uh, and that is what we need to be fighting for. And there is no such thing as a complete peace, but that will uh, be um, a damn sight more peaceful than what we are seeing right now. And it's a very simple answer. We are fighting for equality between the river and the sea, liberation for all who live in that land. Very good. Uh a uh, quick thing on that um <clears throat> from the river to the sea um is um like a zionist uh, uh, slogan you know and likud has it from the river to the sea we turn it uh, around and say a secular democratic state well, that's what it happens because the zionists say if you say from the river to the sea it's anti-semitic because you want to destroy the jewish people we're not gonna destroy nobody Everyone is welcome in a state, a democratic, secular state. And I agree with the um, uh, with Brent, uh, mm -hmm. the rabbi, um, uh, on, on that uh, one. Yes. I want to thank our presenters today, um, Rabbi Rosen, Aya, and Brahim. Thank you so much for participating in this event. We need to schedule another one. <laughs> to go in deeper into a lot of the questions that were raised. Thank you for all the participants. I wanna thank our Zoom Tech team and the collective that helped organize this and bring this together. Thanks again. Um, we want to extend peace for everyone and solidarity mostly. Okay. Aloha from Hawaii. Thank yes. you very much. <laughs> all right. Thanks, so honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, love, uh, love to all. Solidarity. Much love. Thank yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Shout out yeah, to thank Adam. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.